let's talk about what ARM actually does. Because yeah. I think for a lot of people, that's not really clear yet, despite the fact that we're here at CES and almost every product uses your well, product. ARM often gets described as a semiconductor company, and, and we're not. We design uh, building blocks within the chip, so microprocessors, graphics processors, video encode, decode engines. I mean, the cameras that we're using here have our technology in them. The, the technology came from uh, an idea that integrating a 32-bit microprocessor within a more complex chip was going to be a really good idea, and there were going to be lots of uses for that. Turns out there are lots of uses for that. We have hundreds of licensees all around the world, all across the semi-industry, and cumulatively, they have shipped about 120 billion chips containing ARM processors. They're in big screen TVs, and they're in tiny sensors that are, are forming the Internet of Things. You know, the, the range of applications where, where embedded processors are used just goes up and up and up. And with the growth of IoT, we're talking billions, potentially a trillion connected devices, and that's a big opportunity for us. Now, one thing we learned over the last week or two is that almost every device with a chip in it is susceptible to the meltdown and specter attacks as well. Which... Well, I, I wouldn't go that far, actually. I mean, the, um, certainly uh, Spectrum Meltdown have, have raised the awareness of just how, much, how many microprocessors there are in the world. Um, but uh, Spectrum Meltdown exploits uh, uh, features that are used in really high performance microprocessors. Uh, and actually, if you look at that 120-ish billion chips that our licensees have sold in our lifetime, there's only about 5% of them that have the level of sophistication for performance that are exploitable by Spectrum Meltdown. Now, when did you learn about this? So the, the research came to light um, last summer, around June, June-ish, June-July, I can't remember the, the exact date, but it's around the middle of last year. Uh, we and a couple of other companies, Intel, AMD, were contacted by the research team over at Google to say they've been looking at this issue and uh, found a really complex way of learning about the data that was in the system. And it's a side channel attack. You're not directly accessing the data. You're looking at the side effect of using it to work out what the data is. And it was you know, really quite alarming because the, the features that are being exploited have been used by microprocessor designers for literally decades. Over the last six months or so, um, what we did was uh, work with our partners. We worked with Intel, we worked with AMD, uh, worked with the operating system guys to understand the issue. Um, and to work on mitigations, uh, software workarounds to mean that the devices were safe. What we heard on the Intel side is, is that those mitigations have a, there's a performance penalty for those mitigations. Is that the same true on the ARM side as well? It's a bit early to tell, to be honest. It's going to be highly use case dependent, um, highly application dependent. But there is a penalty. Uh, again, hard to say. I, I, think, um, I think in some cases there will be a penalty. Um, in the peak performance case, there's probably a penalty. For you know, most cases, you know, surfing the web, um, browsing email, a lot of the use cases, certainly in a mobile device, you're not going to notice any difference. Now, we've now reached that point where your chips are in billions of devices. What are you doing to prevent a security issue flaw like this to appear again in the future? Because once yeah. you're in all of these devices, they don't all get patched anymore, and they become older and older, and they stay in a home for 15, 20 years. Um, you know, one good thing about the way the software is being pushed out for a Spectrum Meltdown is that largely um, the affected devices are under software control. You can push software updates to them. You can patch the browser. Uh, and that gives that, that mechanism for fixing a problem after the product was shipped. Well, I think we've got to get to that point for everything that is connected. And a lot of early IoT devices just aren't built that way. Sure. We think that has to change. Sure. We've been working for a long time on a IoT device management platform so that any connected device can be managed through its lifetime. Now that sounds a little bit different from your regular business of licensing the IP for, for the chips themselves. Yeah. Does that mean you're looking at different business possibilities there as well in the yeah. IoT space? Yeah, there, there's a lot of sophistication there, even though some of the chips might be relatively simple. And this issue of device management and trying to abstract some of the hardware features so that software can take advantage of them, you know, that's an area that we've been looking at and we do see opportunities for new business there. You know, generally speaking, we're looking at <coughs> um, the future of computing in devices, future of embedded uh, computing. This ability to take data, process it, learn from it is really important. Now what that should do is enhance the experience of using the device. It should enable new functionality 
Um, so, you know, for us, you know, we've always looked at uh, the improvements in computing power uh, from a point of view of what, what can this do for the consumer. So again, as we look at that and we think about what the raw computing elements are that are going to be needed to deliver that experience, that's kind of you know, one of the dimensions on which we're driving our roadmap now. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Thank you.